And considering that uh, I have only, only been given very few minutes, so I'll try to utilize those few minutes to share my message. Uh, before I share my message, I want to take this opportunity to really thank the Coalition of Advocate of South Sudan for holding this very important event. Uh, I also wanted to echo what my colleague uh, said earlier on, that this is the first time, uh, even for me, uh, and I have been uh, here for one year now, to come to the gathering of South Sudan Sudanese with this number. So I want to congratulate you for that. Uh, I also want to thank you uh, for inviting the Embassy of the Republic of South Sudan. Uh, I think what happened in Perth is that he have uh, impacted on how our community has been uh, engaging their government and the representative of their government here in Washington. So I feel uh, honored to have been invited to come and talk to my people uh, as a representative of their government. Uh, I acknowledge that we had difficulties that started in 2013 and we are working uh, together in unison to overcome this problem. Uh, I want to also acknowledge my colleagues, Comrade uh, Inspector Mujanga God. Uh, it's an honor to meet you again here today. Uh, I hope we will meet again in Jabot soon. Uh, I want to also I, I want to also uh, acknowledge my colleagues, Comrade Miyong. Comrade Brad, Comrade Gado, and uh, Mr. Sip, and Comrade uh, Boy, Yo Yo. I only have three messages which I want to share with you today. Uh, and I will get straight to the point. The first message that I want to share with you is that a united diaspora is better than a divided diaspora. And I'm talking to you as somebody who call myself a, a, a former diasporic. Uh, during the struggle, I was a refugee. I lived in the United Kingdom for 17 years. So, when I was transferred from our embassy in China to our embassy in Washington, uh, I was instructed to come and engage the diaspora. And I think I was brought here because maybe my leadership felt that having lived in the diaspora, I would <coughs> emphasize and I will understand how to engage with them. And I feel also uh, honored that our diaspora in, the, uh, in, uh, in North America did not let me down. Since I came, I have been here now for one year. I, I traveled a lot and I met a lot of our community members in different states. So I wanted to, to say, you are not united, and if you are not united, you cannot help us back home. You need to be united. You need to detach yourself, not totally detach yourself, but you need to detach yourself from those uh, negative political engagements that will not help you to, to have a united position that, that uh, the, the government back home can consider. Uh, it is better to, to get one voice, one message coming from the diaspora, and ten different voices with ten different messages coming from the diaspora. So please get organized, get united, and I'm sure the coming transitional government of national unity will, will recognize you and will welcome you. But if you continue to be divided, I doubt if you will have the necessary influence. The second message I want to share with you is we need to support peace. Our leadership have now signed the compromise peace agreement and uh, we need to support this compromise peace agreement. Uh, we need to reconcile our community and we need to work for justice. And one of the reasons why I feel it's very important for us to support the peace is that peace has provided for all these issues. It has provided for reconciliation. It also has provided for, uh, for justice, for those who want to seek justice. 
So uh, everything is provided for in that peace agreement, and we just need to support it. My last message, which is the third message I want to share with you, is very important. It is extremely important. I may even say it is even more important than the two messages I shared. It is about a country that we fought for for 50 years, that has caused us an enormous pain and suffering. We did not get South Sudan on a silver plan. We fought for it for 50 years. We lost millions of our people. And I am saying this with pain. Because in this war, I lost my own father. In this war, I lost my own younger brothers, the ones that came after me immediately. And in this war, including the war of 2013, I lost a cousin on the way to war. We are all heading. The message is, this country that we managed to gain after 50 years of struggle, what were we fighting for? It is for us to have a country, <coughs> a country called the Republic of South Sudan, to be sovereign. Underline this word sovereign. We should never allow that sovereignty to be free. Our president, Salpakir, when he made his reservations after he signed, or just before he signed the peace agreement, yeah, this is very important. This is extremely important. He opened, some people say that the guy has opened a Pandora box, but it is not a Pandora box. We South Sudanese need to, to, to underline the word sovereignty and think about it. I was invited last week by Georgetown University and they asked me to go and talk uh, about statehood and sovereignty. And I did this last night. I was in Georgetown University and I delivered a, a one hour lecture on this very subject. And let me just tell you what I said about sovereignty. I said if South Sudanese see themselves as one diverse people with competing perception of sovereignty, local and national, then the challenge is to reconcile the two perceptions of sovereignty within one Sudan. That is easy, that is a piece of cake for us. But we as South Sudanese, we need to decide is our allegiance to the tribe or to South Sudan? I also said, if South Sudanese see themselves as different people, unwilling, unwillingly lumped together, in a new geographical entity called the Republic of South Sudan, then they will not accept the sovereignty of the new country called the Republic of South Sudan. The same way they rejected, the same way they rejected the sovereignty of the country called the Sudan. Failure to develop national cohesiveness might create room for rebels who believe they have the right to succeed from South Sudan in the same way the South Sudan succeeded from the Sudan. Such groups are likely to become proxies of external forces with their refusal to accept the sovereignty of South Sudan. I'm not going to read more and more because this is, uh, this is a paper of about 10 pages where I was just talking about nationhood and sovereignty in the context of South Sudan. The point I'm trying to make, and this is the, 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 the final word I want to share with you, let us think about sovereignty when we are conducting business in relation to South Sudan. We can lose it. Think what happened to Libya. Think what happened to Iraq. Think what happened to Afghanistan. Think what happened to, uh, to uh, Somalia. These are countries that used to be sovereign, but they are no longer sovereign. Thank you very much.